a pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. He is widely recognized for bold and effective strategies to address complex challenges, including the escape from extreme poverty, the global battle against human-induced climate change, international debt and financial crises, national economic reforms, and the control of pandemic and epidemic diseases. And he's authored and edited numerous books on those topics. Professor Sachs serves as the director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, and he is also president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And so Professor Sachs has been an excellent resource on the war in Ukraine and US policy towards Russia, Ukraine, and NATO. And so we're very grateful to have him here with us today to speak on the pathway to a negotiated peace in Ukraine. So I'll hand it off to you now, Professor Sachs, to take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you for all you do and for the, the wonderful words uh, opening, uh, opening our session today. Can I be very brief so that we can have a discussion? Because I'd like to hear what's on people's minds and also questions. Um, I'm, I'm following events, I'd say, hour by hour and uh, trying to understand what's happening in a complex situation where we're not told the truth on most things. So you have to figure out what's going on because no one's going to tell you and maybe last of all, the New York Times. So uh, it's, it's a real problem to uh, understand this crisis. Let me basically uh, say at the start that uh, we're on an extraordinarily dangerous path of escalation between Russia and the United States. And the war in Ukraine is largely, in my opinion, a proxy war. It's Ukrainians fighting. Uh, and dying. It's uh, American weapon systems, intelligence, uh, so-called uh, officials, strategists, uh, tactical finance that is uh, backing this war. So this is to all uh, effects and purposes a war between uh, the US and Russia, though fought in a proxy way so far. Our goal, we're told from the US side, is to defeat Russia and force it to leave Ukraine after uh, what is described as an unprovoked invasion uh, on February 24th. I think there were lots of provocations, so the situation's more complicated. But let me just start with the, the desired outcome. I don't understand it. I don't understand how it could conceivably be achieved. We think that weapon systems and sanctions and fighting will wear down Putin or get him overthrown and uh, something will change and Russia will go home because they realize that this is uh, not worth it for them. And maybe the US model, and by US, I don't mean us, the American people, we have no part in any of this. The model of those who are uh, prosecuting uh, the US side of this uh, is that it's like Afghanistan or Vietnam was for the United States, that after it gets sufficiently bloody and useless, you just go home. I think there's a huge difference, which is that from Putin's perspective, but I think it's more general than that. It's not just one person. From the perspective of the Russian political actors and elites, uh, the situation in Ukraine is not like America in Vietnam or America in Afghanistan. It's exactly in the neighborhood. And so it's viewed in Russia, I think, I'm not sure, but I think in much, much uh, starker terms that we will not lose this war because this is a war about Russian security. That's the Russian view, okay? You could say they're crazy, not crazy, but I think that's the Russian view. And if that's the Russian view, and our view is we're going to defeat Russia, 
And Russia's view is we're not going to be defeated. <laughs> I, I don't understand what anybody really has in mind other than continued escalation. And it is shocking, but not surprising that every day now we have stories, will he or won't he use nuclear weapons? As if this is just another casual story in some new newspaper uh, column, as opposed to the existential threat to our survival, which it is. So I believe we don't have a plan. I don't think we have a strategy. We want to defeat Russia. And yet Russia doesn't want to be defeated. And even if we could, which I have my doubts about, defeat Russia on conventional weapons basis, Russia has 1,600 active nuclear warheads and 6,000 uh, warheads in total. So I don't understand what our idea is. And again, when I speak of our, it's not mine, <laughs> it's not yours, I think. It's our government's. And I don't even know who's really responsible for this, but it's a very narrow group and it has almost nothing to do with the American people and no one's been asked about it and no one's been informed about it. And no one's been told about it. And yet here we are near the brink of nuclear war and we are near the brink of nuclear war. That's true. So to my mind, we are in a wildly wrongheaded approach. Oh, how did we get here? Again, this is much contested. There are two very different narratives. One narrative is Putin is, you know, has delusions of grandeur and thinks he's Peter the Great and he's going to recreate the Russian Empire. That's the American story we're told all the time. I have a very different view, which is that we got here because the United States just can't keep its goddamn nose out of anyone's backyard. And we kept pushing NATO enlargement. And I was there 32 years ago as advisor to Gorbachev and then advisor to Yeltsin and advisor to Kuchma, first president of independent Ukraine. And I was an advisor to Yatsenyuk just after the 2014 event. So I've watched this pretty close up for 32 years. And I think the US is the provocation. This does not play well in the US media. In fact, it doesn't play at all. I can't get an op-ed published in the US media. They're not interested. They don't want to have any debate at all. So I think we just, it is absolutely true, by the way, that the US and Germany told Gorbachev in 1990. Gorbachev offered, by the way, to disband the Warsaw Pact. That came from Gorbachev. We said, if you disband the Warsaw Pact, we will not use the occasion to move NATO to the east. And that became a condition, actually, for German reunification. And it was ex absolutely explicit. Now, since our government lies about everything, the, the narrative is, oh, we never promised, which is not true. And there's a whole vast documentary record of the US promising no enlargement. Well, of course, as soon as the Soviet Union went away, we thought it was a juicy opportunity to enlarge NATO and started with Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, 1999, and then George W. Bush Jr. added seven more countries, uh, three in the Baltic, so three right on Russia's border, Bulgaria and Romania, which is um, Russia's Black Sea region, and Slovakia and Slovenia. And we continue NATO expansion. And in 2008, Bush said, now we'll go to Ukraine and to Georgia. And to my mind, this was just absolutely the most provocative thing we could do. Because now we're pushing NATO right up against Russia's core security concerns. And 
the Europeans, many European leaders told me in 2008 how dangerous this was and how much they were against it, but the US calls the shots. So ladies and gentlemen, to my mind, we've been stirring the pot the whole time. And there are many complications to this story. So you could, I could talk for hours about the details, but in 2014, the pro-Russian president was overthrown. The US narrative is it was a mass public uh, upheaval against a corrupt president. And I was there on the ground soon afterwards. And I know that the US played a direct role in the overthrow. And the Russians call it a coup. So we have com competing narratives. But the Russians say, Russians say, look, you overthrew the president friendly to our country. We don't want you anywhere close to our borders. At the end of 2021, Putin put forward security demands to the White House. They, at the core of them was don't expand NATO. I called the White House at the end of 2021 to beg them, negotiate. We shouldn't be expanding NATO anyway, negotiate. And I was told, no, we have an open door policy, which means that anyone that wants to join NATO can join NATO. And I said, that's crazy. This isn't a right, this is a threat to another country. This isn't about rights, this is about the effects on the neighbors. And I said, do you believe that Mexico has the right to have a military alliance with China? I don't think so. But that's what you say about Ukraine, that they have the right to have a military alliance with the United States. I said, in any event, it's, they can ask, but it's not prudent for us to do it. Well, the White House refused any negotiations. And then there are competing stories, and I won't go into all the details, but Putin invaded on February 24th, and uh, we've been escalating ever since. And the last week has been filled with news stories, these casual stories of will he or won't he use nuclear weapons as if you know we're trying to predict uh, the, the uh, outcome of the Super Bowl. It's bizarre to me. I've just never seen anything so reckless, and I have no confidence in the US government, no confidence uh, in what we're doing to uh, head this off because they're dead set on uh, doing whatever it takes. That's what they say all the time, whatever it takes to win this, for Ukraine to win this war. And since I don't think Russia is going to lose this war short of nuclear war, to my mind, we're on a recipe of continued escalation. And I'll stop with the reading. I want to read you one uh, set of words from my favorite speech of modern times by an American president, which is President John F. Kennedy's speech on June 10, 1963. And just to give a background about this, I wrote a book about this speech because I love it so much. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy and Khrushchev knew the world's insane. Uh, we can't go on this way. We're going to blow everything up. We need to find a way to peace. And Kennedy gave this speech on June 10, 1963, to convince Americans that it was possible to make peace with the Soviet Union, which was not a conventional view. How can you make peace with the commies? And Kennedy said, you know, we have to check our own attitudes. They're human beings. They have the same desires as we do, and uh, they want to live in peace also. And so if the agreement is mutually satisfactory, it can be mutually observed. Very, very wise words by President Kennedy. And the whole speech is completely wonderful. And I've driven my family crazy for years by making them listen to it on multiple occasions, uh, especially when I was writing the book, they had to listen to it 10 times at least. Uh, but in any event, Kennedy said something that I really, really want to emphasize. Uh, he, he said, and it's the most important statement for this moment. He said, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. 
To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. So what Kennedy is saying is you never, with a nuclear adversary, make them choose between a humiliating defeat and a nuclear war. But that's exactly what we're proposing to do right now with Putin. Not only that, we are every day Zelensky tries to humiliate Putin, not tries to solve a problem, but to humiliate Putin. I, you know, maybe, of course, he's rallying his supporters, but we get closer and closer to the precipice. I can't stand listening to Zelensky, I'm telling you, because I can under, maybe I can understand, although I don't really understand. If I were next door to Russia, I'd have a different language because I wouldn't want to be nuked either. But what he's doing in terms of provocation is extremely dangerous. And we're playing the game because we're saying whatever they do, that's all right. They have to win. I believe that they're the ones shelling the nuclear power plant. I'm absolutely almost sure that it's Ukraine shelling the power plant. Our papers say we don't know who's doing it. But since Russia controls the plant and Ukraine wants to win it back, I think Ukraine is shelling the nuclear power plant. I think, by the way, just to add to uh, the discussion that we are the ones that blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, I'm pretty sure that was a U.S. action. When I said it on television a couple of days ago, they cut me off. They took me off the air immediately because uh, you're not allowed to say this on U.S. television. But it's pretty much conventional wisdom in other parts of the world, even by reporters that don't write it in their paper. If you talk to them privately, they say, of course, it's the U.S. Who else would do it? Who else could do it? Who else had an incentive to do it? So let me stop there. It's so dangerous. We have no debate in this country, uh, in Congress or any place else. They're not asking us to be part of this discussion, even though it's our lives on the line and our children's lives and our grandchildren's lives. New York City is extraordinarily vulnerable, I don't have to mention. And our congressmen aren't saying boo. So one thing I'd love for us to do is reach the New York delegation to just say, this is reckless. Stop it. We're in the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis this month. We don't want to replay it. And we would never have survived it had it not been for Kennedy in that position, because it, if it had been any of his advisors, the world would have been destroyed. But he was smart enough not to destroy the world. So let me stop there and uh, turn it over and uh, open for discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Professor Sachs. Um, yeah, we have a lot of, of really thoughtful and important questions. And there are a lot of folks who are um, skeptical or curious as to how realistic it would be for the US to negotiate with Putin. Um, depending, you know, on what people's opinions about Putin and Russia's aims. Um, but so what- let, let me just say one, one thing about that. We, we don't know uh, whether negotiations would work or not. It's true. Um, I personally believe they would because I know a lot of the Russian leaders over a long period. And I believe that there is absolutely a way to negotiate <laughs> and that the central question is NATO enlargement. And that's the question the US has never accepted even discussing. But let me say the following. Suppose we negotiated something and that it was satisfactory, but then Russia violated it, which is possible, then we would be in no worse situation than we are right now, but we would at least have the whole world know that we went the extra mile to try to find peace and the other side violated it. And that to my mind is the right approach. 
The right approach is to try for peace. And if it fails, you end up in war. But if it, uh, if you say there's no one to negotiate with, then you're surely in war. So I want to try the exit ramp, not guaranteeing, because nothing in life is a guarantee, not guaranteeing it would work, but believing that it would. I have lots of reasons to believe that it would. Russia is not a sole actor by itself. China is a very important actor in this. China actually would like a peace agreement. China would like to insist on a peace agreement. India would like a peace agreement. They don't want a peace agreement in which NATO enlarges because the US is targeting China too. But they want a peace agreement that is satisfactory. And so there are many ways to enforce a peace agreement beyond just a piece of paper. There are many interests at stake. And by the way, the Russians uh, honor agreements at times. We do too sometimes. We break them a lot also. The Ukrainians broke agreements. They absolutely would not implement the Minsk agreements. So the Russians say, look, how can we negotiate? You lie to us, you cheat. Britain, uh, France and Germany were supposed to be the guarantors of the Minsk II agreement. When the Ukrainians say, ah, we don't like this agreement, then France and uh, Germany remain silent because they're on the Western side. So there is a, a lot of deceit, but it's not just Putin. And our division of the world into the pure good and the pure evil is phony. And it's phony here as well. So my view is, and I can tell you, you know, all over the world, people basically agree with what I'm saying, which is, yeah, this is a war about NATO enlargement. And if it isn't, we should prove that. We should say, okay, we won't enlarge NATO. Now let's see if you stop the war. If you don't, then it exposes. This isn't about NATO enlargement. This is about your empire building. Then you get the whole world on side. But right now the whole world isn't on side. I'm not on side, but a lot of the rest of the world's not on side because they believe this is a proxy war between the US and Russia. So for in terms of a negotiated settlement and what is really possible, NATO enlargement would sort of have to be the key piece of that. I think it's the center. There are three issues that are that were mentioned every time. And remember something really interesting, another one of these mysteries. In mid-March, there was a, uh, a flurry of statements by Russia, Ukraine, <laughs> and Turkey, which was mediator, that the two sides had come close to an agreement and that they actually exchanged papers. And I spoke with very senior Russian, a very, very senior Russian official about this who described this to me. And uh, actually the Ukrainians put forward the idea of neutrality. This immediately went to Putin. Putin said, let's draft a, a, a peace agreement around this. The Russians did, they put it back to Zelensky and then Zelensky said, no, I've, uh, that's, that's not what I meant. And the strong rumors, which I believe, are that the United States and UK said to Zelensky, hell no, you want us to back you, we're not backing neutrality. And that this was a complete change and it was the end of the negotiations. So I think the US has been completely uninterested in the negotiations. That week, Biden flew to a NATO meeting in uh, Brussels and declared this is going to be a long war. And then he went from, uh, went from Brussels to Warsaw and said that man can't stay in power. And then a few days later, Lloyd Austin said uh, our goal is to weaken Russia. So I think it's U.S. policy not to have a negotiated solution. I think there was close to a negotiated outcome beforehand. And I watch lots of Russian blogs and they call for negotiations, which is if, if it were Russia's desire not to negotiate, you wouldn't have the Russian bloggers calling for negotiations. I think Russia's idea was we can 
we can scare Ukraine into neutrality, if I could put it that way. That was the original idea of, of the invasion. And I think it was a desperate move, but I think the motivating factor of the move was that the U.S. was heavily arming Ukraine and threatening Russian security. And Russia could not get U.S. attention. This is the basic point. We treat Russia like shit, if you'll excuse me, which is they put forward negotiating demands and we say, no, no interest. Why should we talk to you? You're a fourth rate power. You're delusional. We're the superpower. And that, I think, is the basic point. Then we say there's no one to negotiate with after we say we're not negotiating. But if you, you don't know if there's someone to negotiate with till you negotiate with them. And frankly, we didn't even try. So, and if we tried and failed, we'd have the whole world on our side immediately. So you had mentioned that uh, members of Congress haven't made a strong call for diplomatic solutions. And there was a letter in Congress um, led by Representative Jayapal calling on the Biden administration to make a stronger diplomatic effort um, toward ending the war. And so why do you think um, progressive or liberal members of Congress um, were hesitant to sign that letter? And what can we as grassroots advocates do that, to push yeah. in that direction? Thank, thank you for uh, letting me know about that. I wasn't even aware of uh, Congresswoman Jayapal's letter, uh, so I'm I'm happy that someone has done it. And again, I'm I'm in Europe uh, these weeks, so I I may not know all that's happening in the U.S. debate, but I don't hear a word from officialdom uh, of uh, the contrary, and I think partly. People who aren't looking too closely easily can accept the official narrative that, you know, that Putin invaded unprovoked uh, and uh, the guy's a madman and uh, we have to uh, defend freedom. It, it's a good story. Uh, it, it actually has elements of truth to it, uh, but not very many. Uh, and it's hugely misleading, but but it is an acceptable story. And I think for most Congress people, it's a kind of the default story. I don't think they know. But what is amazing to me is they don't even discuss anything. So there's no, I talk to a lot of officials, they don't know the history. Even senior officials in the US government don't know the background and they don't care. And so in Congress, it's much worse. Uh, but I do think we could do something, actually. I, I really do think that if, if we had a, an online gathering with the New York delegation, because this is urgent, and said, all of you, come on, let's have a discussion together. This is nuclear war, after all. You can spare a few, an hour. And we actually had a discussion with the New York delegation. I bet it would make a difference. I think they just don't know, frankly. There's a lot to tease apart in this. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of, and, and the newspapers are so uh, unbelievably, <laughs> unbelievably uh, without, analytical edge that it's easy to get completely uh, completely uh, pulled into this it is kind of the mainstream story. And so I, th I think that this could make a difference, actually, I really do. I got to hope that it could. Yeah, thank you. And so uh, I guess a follow up to that is in in advocating for our members of Congress um, to take steps toward a diplomatic solution, do you think peace activists should demand that the US get out of NATO um, or stop, take a position of stopping NATO enlargement because the US is using NATO for hegemony? I, I think that the peace community should call for negotiations now. 
uh, that uh, can defuse this crisis before nuclear war. I think that that is the absolute uh, most important thing to do. People are scared and should be scared. And by the way, every day when I read someone say, we're not going to be uh, we're not going to be intimidated by this. I say, what the hell do you know? <laughs> you, we're, we're all going to be incinerated if you get this wrong. Uh, and I know, because I've studied it for 50 years, how close we have come to nuclear war. And given that we are on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis, somebody ought to think a little bit more clearly about this. Maybe our key people in office are some of them are too young to remember this or they haven't studied it they don't understand it they don't know how dangerous this is but uh i i i think that the focus should be stop this escalation we are on the precipice this is crazy and there is a way to negotiate an outcome and the two sides were negotiating in march send them back to the negotiating table, but with U.S. support for negotiations. That, to my mind, is the key. All right, thank you. And I'm just uh, keeping an eye on the time and wondering if we're if we're nearing the end of our time with you. Or... Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that I'm late for something, but uh, let's take a couple questions and then we'll finish up. Sure. Um, so a lot of our members were interested in understanding the effects of the war on climate change and food security. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak to that. Oh, we have uh, to step generally. Six o'clock past door, 6.30 Tulsi, and then we're off to- Okay, I'm finishing. Yeah, it has to finish by six. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah, I, I, have, to, I have to finish uh, shortly. My wife is telling me and she's the boss. So, um, uh, sorry. I, about the effects of all of this on uh, on climate change and and food security and food security everything is bad about this crisis there is no silver lining period because you cannot address any big challenge in an organized way in the midst of war and so the immediate effects of all of this as you know have been economic destabilization, soaring fertilizer prices, soaring food prices, soaring energy prices. Uh, and that's a part of what's happening. And But uh, I'd say even a larger part is there's no international cooperative processes on development or climate or anything else as our geopolitical situation darkens. We're hardly speaking to the Chinese. We are, of course, at war with Russia. And institutions like the G20, which are supposed to be working on global challenges like climate change, are uh, dysfunctional right now because they include the two sides to this conflict. And uh, there are many, many countries in deep hunger crisis right now that get no attention. I know it because they appeal to me in my United Nations context uh, role. I met uh, world leaders <laughs> at the UN General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, some in absolutely desperate condition. And I spoke to a very senior UN official yesterday who's trying to help on the hunger side, but he can't even get access to senior policymakers right now, even though he's representing Secretary General, because our institutions are not uh, paying attention to any of these things. They're paying attention to the war and to the election. Great, thank you for that. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should stop at this point, but just to say, uh, if, if you could, uh, if you could see a way to getting some of our uh, delegation on online or you'd like me to help with that uh, but i'd ask you to take the lead but uh, use my name uh, and so forth i think uh, this would be a great next step um, and really necessary and a core democratic step because our congressmen and women owe it to us to talk with us about this. 
Uh, this is dire and we need to have a conversation. So you could count on me to join in on that. That's great. Thank you so much. I, I feel pretty sure we'll take you up on that. Um, Wonderful. Thank you for joining us and for being yeah, here. Yeah, thanks to everybody. Sorry we didn't have time for all the questions. And I know, uh, you know people had further thoughts and some skepticism on some of it and so forth. It's just a very confused, very difficult, but extraordinarily dangerous situation. So I thank you. The voice of peace is the most important message right now, period. And uh, we absolutely need to pull back from the precipice that we're, that we're deliberately climbing towards right now. So thank you very much and hope that we're together soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bye -bye. Staff. We're losing control of the situation that because of the sanctions, Europe is falling apart. Italy is peeling off. I mean, you know, Giorgino Mol Molina, Molina, Molini, um, I can't pronounce her name, um, but she, uh, you know, she is, she's, she's making some very bold statements about, um, about, you know, the future of the EU uh, and the role that Italy is going to play and not play. Um, and she's going to be under even more pressure to continue this kind of divorce from the EU as her economy is impacted by these sanctions and, and, and the energy. All of Europe is fine. Germany is very much at risk. And so the United States, I believe, decided to take Nord Stream 2 off the table, to remove it as an option for the German government, as a way of basically saying, Germany, you have no choice but to stay the course. We're not giving you an off-ramp. There is no off-ramp. One of the most short-sighted decisions ever made. If it turns out that the United States did this, I strongly believe they did, and it can be demonstrated the United States did this, we literally just lost Europe. We just lost Europe. Decades, eight decades of European US relations that have been developing since the end of the Second World War. Um, you know, and it's, it's a relationship that's totally one sided. I think anybody who studies it understands uh, what the G7, what the European Union, and what NATO are. They are extensions of American foreign and national security policy, they're tools of American policy. But there's a pretense of friendship, a pretense of an alliance there. Um, that pretense is going to be eliminated because Europe is going to wake up, and I believe Europe is already waking up to the reality that the United States doesn't care about Europe at all. None. Zero. Why else would we do this to the Germans, our ostensible allies? We blow up a $12 billion piece of infrastructure that is, even though it's majority owned by Gazprom, 49% of it's owned by a European conglomerate. Uh, it provides Germany's economic potential. We literally have condemned Germany to go from being Europe's number one economy to being on the bottom third. By the time this winter is done, Germany will have collapsed, will have collapsed. It will not be the power that it was, and it's not going to resurrect because where are they going to get their gas? From the United States that's going to sell them liquid natural gas? At what price? Are we going to be good friends and sell it to them cheap? Are we going to match the Russian price? Or are we going to sit there and say, you know, this is good for American business. Pour it on, baby. Charge them triple. Charge them the going rate. Don't blame us. It's the market. Um, no, I, the United States has been exposed. And, and this is, I think, the consequence of this. This is going to go down in history as one of those pivotal moments where the basically the veil was ripped from the eyes of Europe. And they suddenly realized that person they thought was a friend wasn't. Actually, worse than that, they were an enemy, and they've been an enemy all along. Yeah, yeah, I got to agree. You know, as I said, I'm, I'm in Britain now. I've been in here for the last few months. I'll be coming back to the United States next week, a few days, actually. Um, and it, it's, it's amazing to watch the destruction of the British economy here. In fact, I, I wrote a long piece about it on my Facebook page, if folks want to go there and, and take a look. Um, but uh, uh, the prices for energy, um, if they let the market determine what it was, it would be about five times as high as it was last year. So they put a cap on it, and the cap is just for six months, then they're going to take it off, or they're going to have to make it some other kind of cap. But the cap still caps it at two and a half times what the energy costs were last year. This is at the same time that there's rampant inflation. I mean, if you um, uh, if you sanction a country that provides a lot of the 
uh, energy for uh, Europe, um, energy prices go up. If you sanction a country that provides a lot of the grain and food and fertilizer, uh, food prices go up. And not just that, when energy goes up, transportation goes up, the cost for industry goes up, they're less competitive. So there's a recession at the same time. In Britain right now, there is a recession and so plus there's double digit inflation and people are seriously worried about how they're gonna get through the winter. Are they gonna be able to heat? Are they gonna be able to eat? What are they gonna be able to do? I was listening today about a story about kids who are staying out of school. Part of the reason that they mentioned was that they can't afford the bus fare to get to school. Um, I mean, the economy is going in bad, a terrible way. And what does Liz Trust do in the conservative government here? They give tax breaks, which grace, greatly favor the rich. And how are they going to pay for the tax breaks? Some people said, well, you should tax the windfall profits of the energy companies because they're making windfall profits. And so are also the, the um, military companies. They're making windfall profits. You should tax the windfall profits to pay for it. But they say, of course, no, they're borrowing money. And the IMF looked at what's going on and saying, well, how are you going to pay, pay this back? You don't have a scheme to do it. And the IMF publicly criticize them. They never publicly criticize an advanced capitalist country. They publicize the global, they criticize the global south. And as a result, the pound went way down um, compared to the dollar. And since the dollar is used for trade and the dollar is used for especially for trade and energy, it means all of that goes higher and inflation goes, goes higher. So they're in a terrible situation right here. And it's no different than in other places. You're talking about Germany and, and other places. We're going to see the same kind of thing. How they're going to get out of it, I don't know. Um, they believe somehow they're going to continue to sanction Russia, and that's going to cause Russia to collapse, and everything is going to go their way. But they now have destroyed the pipeline that could give them the gas that they need. So I think uh, there's a... a, a, a very bad situation that people are going to see in the next several months and how that's all going to work out politically in terms of the imperialist role of the United States, especially with uh, China growing um, to a bigger economy, perhaps even bigger than the United States, with Russia, the largest landmass in the world, with a lot of resources, minerals. What is going to happen? And, and Russia is turning its back now to the West because of these attacks and is looking towards, towards the East. So we're going to see uh, a difficult time for the people in the West, including ourselves, I think. And but we're going to get through this period somehow. And hopefully we'll see a, a world with a weakened um, imperialist U.S. And that, I think, will be in the long run, be better for everyone. So let me just end with this. Um, Scott, you're mentioning some of the other areas that might go towards Russia. I was in not too long ago into Odessa right before in 2019, and I, I saw the Russian population there. They, we, we were there as observers on the Memorial Day when the Nazis had killed all the people at the House of Trade Unions, and thousands and thousands of people paraded through all day and left flowers. And then at one point, the um, uh, families of the people that were killed were going to speak, but the police wouldn't let them use the sound system. But Nazis mobilized from throughout Ukraine, and they tried to intimidate them. And they, at night, marched through the streets with a candle, with uh, torchlights, and they themselves held a rally, which the police did let them use um, uh, their uh, sound system for. We witnessed this, but the woman that helped us come there she was put on um, a Nazi website and she couldn't stay. She had to leave the country because she was fearful. And really hundreds of thousands left the country for just these reasons, mostly going to Russia, but it was never said during this whole period, especially since 2014. And one of the other people that spoke to us about what happened was a survivor of what happened at the House of Trade Unions where the Nazis killed about 50 people and wounded hundreds. Um, and since then, he's been picked up by the Nazis. 
and nobody knows what's happened to him, where he's arrested. We saw a picture of him being picked up. We can't even find out his whereabouts. And this seems to be happening with many, many people. But you yourself has been put on a, a list. And my good friend, um, Ava Bartlett was put on, on such a list. She's uh, a Canadian journalist who's now in the Dunbos and has been interviewing people. You've got to listen to her interviews because you won't hear it in the West. She talks to people about what they think about this and what they think about going back to Russia and the referendum and why they're doing it. And it's things you won't hear in the Western media, but she also has been put on a list. You could listen to some of that on my um, Facebook page if folks want to go there. Um, so wh what do you think about this? First of all, are you concerned about you being on this list? Um, uh, what, what does it mean? Why isn't the United States standing up for you as an American citizen? Um, why isn't Canada standing up for Ava Bartlett? Why is uh, Britain sanctioning its own um, uh, journalists who have gone to Dun Dunbos just to cover what's really happening there because they don't want it to be covered? So what's your thoughts on, on this, this um, uh, threats and, and this, uh, you know, um, uh, activity? Well, this, this, this isn't my first rodeo. Um, I, 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 I was put on the receiving end of, uh, you, you know, U.S. government anger when I spoke out about Iraq and weapons of mass destruction. So I, I fully know what it's like uh, when truth has been deemed to be the, 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 the enemy. Um, and it, that was the case in the lead up to the war in Iraq, and it's the it's the uh, it's the situation today. Truth is the enemy. People, you know, the the, the situation between Russia and Ukraine, uh, and Russia and the West is a very complicated situation. I happen to believe that Russia is on the right side of history, but you know, I'm willing to uh, respect anybody who disagrees with me. I'm willing to engage in a informed, uh, civil debate, dialogue, and discussion because. There might be things out there that I'm not aware of. There might be perspectives that need to be heard. Um, and, and that's all I'm trying to do. You know, you're not going to see me uh, shouting anybody down, trying to shut anybody up. I simply have my positions. Some are very strongly held, but they're positions that I tend to believe are fact-based. Um, but they right now they run counter to the narrative being pushed by the U.S. government. Um, now, this is more than just the United States simply trying to silence. You know, Twitter banned me. Twitter banned me because um, Twitter's under pressure from the U.S. Congress. Um, some people said, well, you should sue. This is a First Amendment thing. You can make a case that Congress uh, has put pressure on Twitter to uh, de facto get around First Amendment restrictions and prevent Congress from passing laws that abridge free speech. Um, that's a complicated legal process. I don't have the time, the money. <laughs> To, to do something like that. But now we have this situation where the Ukrainian government has published a list. Uh, it's put out by the Center for uh, Countering Disinformation. Um, this, this list was promulgated on July 14th. Uh, I'm featured on this list. Um, the people on this list are labeled not just Russian propagandists. And right off the bat, in the United States, I think people need to understand that when you put that term out there and you say you're a Russian propagandist, that has a chilling effect on everything. It immediately denies you access to media outlets um, because you can't let a Russian propagandist on. It allows you to be shut down on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. But then they go on and they say, no, no, you're not just a Russian propagandist. You're an information terrorist and a war criminal who deserves to be arrested and prosecuted as such. Okay, that's extreme. But then people say, well, that's just the Ukrainian government. Scott, come on. What are you worried about the Ukrainian government? Except in May of this year, the United States Congress passed a law, Public Law 117-128, that funds this very center. The salaries of the people in this center are paid for by the U.S. taxpayer dollars. And now, it's when they, prom when they held this meeting on July 14th, the meeting was organized by a non-government organization uh, funded by Congress, the U.S. Congress, and it was attended by the United States State Department who made the green light to this list. So now what we have is the U.S. Congress funding by a passing a law which funds a center for disarmament or for, for countering disinformation that labels Americans as information terrorists. And this is being done in concert with the U.S. government. This I have a problem with. This is a frontal assault. 
on the First Amendment. This is Congress passing a law that directly abridges the right to speak. Now, am I worried about being called a Russian propagandist? Yeah, you know what? Places I used to write for don't publish me anymore because of that. They say, oh, well, you're a Russian propagandist. We can't have you writing for us. <laughs> it was okay when I was <laughs> writing something that was the number one article for the year in terms of clicks for them, but suddenly I'm a Russian propagandist. I can't be touched. Um, you know, so there's a chilling effect. It has an economic aspect to it. Uh, but then in September, this, this center met again, again with the State Department in attendance and supporting all of NATO support. And you ask why, what Canada is doing about uh, Ms. Bartlett, how we know. The Ukrainians said, it's not just that they're an information terrorist. We, want, we don't want to focus on the information. We want to focus on the terrorist aspect. And we want everybody on this list to be treated as a terrorist. What does that mean? In America, we hunt down and kill terrorists. Is that what the Ukrainian government's asking for? And the answer is yes, because there's a second list. There's a second list put out by an organization called Mir Thorets, the brother or the, the oh gosh, peacemakers, peacemakers, Mir Thorets. Um, this list has been around since 2014. Um, this is a hit list, an honest to God hit list. The people on this list die, they get murdered. Uh, this is serious business. Uh, Daria Dugan, the daughter of Alexander Dugan, a Russian philosopher, was killed. Um, and this list put a mark through her face and said liquidated. They, they reveled the fact that she died. Another person has recently disappeared who's on that list. I'm on that list. Other Americans are on that list. Eve is on that list. This is a hit list. And, you know, shortly after that list came out, videos started to appear where, the, where masked people are saying, Scott Ritter, we know where you live. Scott Ritter, we're going to kill you. Scott Ritter, we're going to kill your family. Scott Ritter, you can't sleep. When I uh, participate in chats like this, people come into the chat and say, Scott, go boom, boom. Now, do I take that seriously? You're damn right I do. Every morning I go out and I check my car. You know, I, I used to be a trained counter-terrorist dude, so I, I know how to do the quick, you know, 360 around the car. But why the hell do I have to do a 360 walk around my car in Del Mar, New York? Why? Why is the U.S. government allowing this? Why hasn't the United States put a bomb on the very center that's targeting Americans. Isn't that what the government's there for, to protect American citizens? You know, if ISIS was doing this, we'd be doing it differently. But no, when the neo-Nazis in Ukraine target Americans, it's okay. And it's not a joke. People die on this list. And people say, well, Scott, Ukraine's thousands of miles away. Stephenville, Stephenville, New York's just 100 miles down the road. What's there? A Bandera monument to Stepan Bandera and four other neo-Nazis who murdered hundreds of thousands of people in World War II. And every summer, these Bandera-worshipping Ukrainian-Americans gather there, hold their torchlight ceremonies, wear their Nazi uniforms, sing their songs, glorify Bandera. America is full of people who are indoctrinated with the ideology of Stepan Bandera, and they've been told by the U.S. government that I'm an information terrorist, with an emphasis on the terrorist, and that I should be treated as such. It doesn't take too much imagination to understand that in this day and age of political violence, there's a real possibility that one of these step on Bandera worshiping goons will decide to take the law into their own hands, come up to Del Mar, New York, and do what the U.S. government says should be done. Kill me. So, yeah, I take it very, very seriously. Am I losing sleep over it? Not really. Um, I got a dog that barks so whenever a fly buzzes in the house, so he's a pretty good detection system. You know, I've, I've done, I'm not going to say what I've done, but I've done that which is necessary to uh, secure my, my house and my family. Uh, but why in God's name do I have to live like this? Why should anybody have to live like this? And why isn't the U.S. government doing about something about it? And more important, why isn't Chuck Schumer doing something about it? Why isn't Kristen Gillibrand doing something about it? Why isn't Paul Tonko doing something about it? I've written them. I've talked to them about this. They're ignoring it. They're ignoring the fact that they voted for a law that funds the Ukrainian government to bypass constitutional restriction on Congress from passing a law that abridges first speech. This is a serious issue. This is a big issue. Um, you know, and, and to the average American, let me just tell you right now, there before the grace of God goes you. If you can sit there and say, well, this is between Scott and the U.S. government. Okay, it is. You're right. It's, it's, it's not your fight, but it is your fight. The Constitution's your fight. Anything, anytime constitutional rights are abridged, it's your fight. The Constitution belongs to we, the people of the United States of America. And if we are willing to step up and defend it, 
then once they start taking the rights away from one person, they've taken away from all, and all of us are at risk. Maybe not from Ukrainian neo-Nazis who live in New York, but from the U.S. government and from anybody else who will seek to, um, you know, basically run a frontal assault on the rights that were supposed to be guaranteed under the Constitution. You're absolutely right. It, it is something that should never happen, and it does. And all of us that speak out feel it to some extent. We feel the pressure. Not all of us have been threatened in the way you have, but many of us have and have had our social media accounts um, sanctioned in some ways or another. Uh, a group, including friends of mine from the African People's Socialist Party, which has a position similar on Ukraine to what you have and to what I have. Um, the leader of that organization, an 80-year-old man and his wife, had their house invaded with stun grenades. They broke through the door. They handcuffed them on the street and arrested them and accused them of being Russian agents. This can happen more and more. You know, we have people like Julian Assange, who is, um, they want to put him in jail for 150 years. He's been in jail for how long? For what? For telling the truth? Or, oh, or, truth. or um, Daniel Hale, who was, you know, a, a pilot of, uh, um, of drones. He said they kill um, uh, civilians more than they kill anybody else. And for that, they said he was dead. Uh, giving some classified information. So they put him in jail for four years. Um, you know, at one point during World War I, the Espionage Act was used to put the entire IWW, International Workers of the World, in, in jail. Um, uh, the, the socialist uh, candidate Eugene Debs was put in jail for opposing that war to run. They can do that. And they did it again during the 50s. Many um, people were put in jail. And there is a there is a statement of the anti of the um, labor movement that an injury to one is an injury to all, and our movement has to live by that. When one of us is threatened, we must consider that we're all threatened. We must come to all, all of our uh, the defense of anybody that's threatened in any way we can, politically, physically, or any way. And so, you have friends, Scott. Besides enemies, you have a lot of friends. Um, so, um, you're an amazing person, Scott, and thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for um, having me. <laughs>